guys can hear me all right? Good morning. Thank you for that kind word, Dave. I appreciate it very much. Good morning, everybody. Isn't it exciting to see uh, the changes? I mean, as a, as a person that's a member here, to know that we're uh, being thought of so critically, uh, so lovingly, to be cared for, and everybody is willing to say, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, welcome, Stan, Mel. We really appreciate you guys being on staff. I'm looking forward to being uh, cared and led uh, by you guys very much. It's a pleasure to worship with you guys today. Uh, if you have your Bible, your copy of God's Word, you can be turning to Psalm chapter 27, which will be where we will be uh, camping out for today. While you're turning there, uh, before we begin, I would like to ask for maybe a little bit of audience participation. It's uh, Family Sunday. Kids, you're more than welcome to do this. Uh, we're going somewhere with this, so if you would like, if you're capable, I'd like to ask you to maybe extend your arms. You could keep them on the armrest if you want, but what I really want is for you to make a fist, a tight fist. I want those forearms tensing up. You can go extra credit, and you can hold them up, or you can do Moses style and hit your neighbor, please, not too hard. But what I want you to do, until I ask you to relax or relieve that tension, I just need you to hold it, okay? We all ready for that? Okay, great. Uh, so a little bit of my introduction, as, I, as, as Dave said, I'm married to my wife, Allie. We've been married for about 15 and a half years. Uh, I've got an 11, a 9, a 5, and a 2-month-old, and uh, that has been a blessing in my life. My children are a wonderful blessing. Uh, I've been ministering to teenagers and their families in some form or fashion for about 20 years now, which is very strange for me to contemplate that over half of my life has been working with teenagers. I should have been disqualified for those early halves because I was almost a teenager myself. Um, but I love working with students, and I currently serve in the middle school and high school ministry here at CLF with, hands down, not just, you know, stage talk, the best team I've ever worked with when it comes to caring and loving students. So uh, you families, you're very blessed to have a team care for them. I love to teach the Bible. I love to see a life transformed by the gospel. I absolutely love it. It's just one of the best things that I can uh, just hang my hat on at the end of the day when I see the gospel shaping a life. It's just no fuller feeling. During the past 20 years of my life in ministry, I've had the opportunity to praise the Lord for his goodness in our lives, but that praise has not always come in moments of, of smiles or satisfaction. In Psalm 27, we're going to see an intimate diary entry from David dealing with the providence of God, especially amid David's enemies knocking at his door. And my prayer for you today is that you would find kinship with David's attitude, his confidence, and maybe, just maybe, if I could be so bold, to find kinship with some of David's circumstances found here in this psalm, but all for the glory of the Lord. What do I mean by that? Well, I can't say that being surrounded by our enemies, discrediting our name, or seeking to bring us physical harm is really that good. However, there is a trueness of faith and godly character shown in this psalm that I would desire for everyone here today. Just think, do you gain battle-tested confidence in the Lord without battle? Does one desire to run to the Lord's presence if they've never felt the peace of his embrace and the power of his mighty hand? Some of us here today are trying to form your very own battle plans. I want to have faith in God. I really do. And I want to, I trust that he's in control, but the rent has come due and I'm out of options. Or maybe you're thinking, I want a child to be raised in the right way, but their mom or their dad seem to be against every single effort that I'm taking at this very moment. It's like one step forward and three steps back. Some of you are here today in the middle of real, life-threatening illnesses. And all your thoughts are seeking hope for deliverance from that, that real life-threatening pain. The truth is that for a believer, the desire to put our faith and trust in God's hands and to desire to also for a way out of threatening circumstances is a tension we all carry at one time or another. Kind of like that tension you're probably feeling in your forearms right about now, wouldn't you say? It makes you wonder, what if there's a better way than holding on to this tension? Could there be a better way to live in the midst of family tension, 
increasing pressures at work, or the desire to grow in your relationship with God? Okay, everybody can release that tension. How's it feel? Shake it out a little bit. How many of you went, went, went full bore up here? You can go ahead and let it down. It feels good to release tension. The reality is, brothers and sisters, there is a better way, a more beautiful way to face life's intensely difficult circumstances. Today, my aim is to look into the verses of Psalm 27 and for us to learn together what it looks like to turn our focus to the beautiful and all-powerful God while in the midst of tense and harmful circumstances. Here's a roadmap of where we're gonna be going. First, we're going to read through the Psalm here in just a moment. We'll second, consider David's attitude amidst his earthly realities. And then we're gonna discuss the major concepts that come mainly from verse four, the beauty of the Lord. We're gonna ask the questions, why do we need the beauty of the Lord? What is it? And how does it change our lives? And finally, we're gonna look at God's beautiful answer to our most threatening life circumstance. As we read the Psalm aloud here in a moment, I'd like to invite you to fix your attention on two things. First, note the tone that David is expressing and how his tone shifts throughout his correspondence and his circumstances. Second thing I want us to consider today is just what the author of the psalm is considering, and we're gonna make that our big idea for today, which is the beauty of the Lord far exceeds and outweighs all of life's betrayal, heartache, fear, and despair. We can walk with confidence through it all thanks to the cross of Christ. So I'd like to ask if you are able to please stand for the reading of God's word. We ask you to stand here at CLF to show respect for the word of God and to give proper honor and glory to it. So we appreciate you doing that. Psalm 27, starting in verse one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. In whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me and eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise against me. In this I will be confident. One thing, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I would seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent and he will lift me high up on a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me and I will offer in his tent sacrifices of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but you, the Lord, will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They breathe out violence. I believe I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I, I join and ask that we would seek your face, Lord, that we would look to be surrounded by you in your presence. May it be the one true guide, the one thing we seek to worship upon the beauty of the Lord, even amidst some real circumstances, Father, that I know many of us are involved in. Some real pain, some real life-threatening situations, God, I pray that you would be near to those who are struggling today. All for your glory, so that we may see you and know that you are truly in charge and in power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So Psalm 27 is simply titled, A Psalm of David. 
as with many of David's psalms, it's impossible to really assertively place which period of David's life this psalm was penned. The psalmist speaks of trouble from David's adversaries, false witnesses against his account, violent men, all things David faced in his early life and in his middle life, and also in David's end of his life as well. I mean, lucky guy David, wouldn't you say? This psalm is a supplication in which, as elsewhere, the speaker in the great distress implores God to intervene on his behalf. Notable areas in scripture that we can find in the Bible elsewhere are like in Psalm 86, verses one and two. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Or Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. Or even Jesus' prayer in the garden in Matthew 26, where he prays, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. If you're taking notes today by using our handout, uh, you can get started here. Uh, When we came in, we hope you got a handout if you want one where we're talking about David's attitude in the midst of his earthly realities. The distinction of emphasis is that the poem begins with a confident claim of God as a source of help under all grave threats. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? What's a rhetorical question implying that there's no person, place, or thing that should take captive our hearts in fear while the Lord is on his throne? This positive claim continues throughout verses two, three, five, six, and most extravagantly in verse 10, where he writes, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but even the Lord, he will take me in. Even with this deep sense of trust, David is proclaiming, you can see a sense of urgency in the speaker's plea to God. Like in verse nine, when he cries out, hide not your face from me, turn not your servant away in anger, O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O oh God, my salvation. So this positive assertion in the Lord mixed with a fearful cry of help to the deliverer is just quintessentially David in a nutshell. Just take one of David's most memorable lines from Psalm 23 as an example. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David continues in Psalm 27, verses two through three. I think we have it up here on the board. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet this I will be confident. David is referencing here back to a battle with Goliath and the Philistines. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 17 in verse 44, Goliath told the young David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Certainly David must have had that in mind when he wrote, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. I suppose David's confidence in God wasn't something that came, you know, just naturally or easily to him. He had to fight for it day after day. He was tested in battle. He was tested in exile, as Dave York preached about a couple weeks ago when he talked about the relationship with his son Absalom. He was tested in the midst of personal tragedy as well. But through it all, he sought the Lord's presence that is safe, where he has experienced fullness of joy. That is why David's Psalms are so intensely powerful to me. They're not songs of a man who has not known hardship. They are the songs of a man who has known the depths of despair, but who has also known the heights of God's goodness. The psalm is about turning to God in the midst of crisis and difficult circumstances. And David speaks much about the blessing of doing so. I like what Charles Spurgeon said in a sermon on these verses. The enemies of our souls are not deficient in ferocity. They yield no quarter and ought to have none in return. See what danger David was in the grip 
and grasp of numerous powerful and cruel enemies. And yet, observe his perfect safety in their utter discomfiture. They stumble and fell. God's breath blew them off their legs. They were stones in the way which they never reckoned upon. And over these, they made an ignominious tumble. What a word, right? This was truly, this was literally true in the case of the Lord in Gethsemane, when those who came to take him went backward and fell to the ground. And herein, he was a prophetic representative of all wrestling believers who rise from their knees, shall, by the power of faith, throw their foes upon their faces. So when evildoers assail me and eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall, David says. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. Have you been there? Have you been surrounded by people who mean you ill, who discredit you? Are you confident in the middle of real, gut-wrenching, tough life circumstances? Families divided against family. Are you confident? As we move into verse four, I want you to note a marked tone change, at least I think, between David's earthly realities, the evildoers, adversaries, and armies encamped around him, to David's one aim. You know, there are many lessons learned in being part of a family and in marriage. One of the more difficult lessons I seem to be learning and relearning is the most important quote, uh, that tone matters, okay? I have been told many times, <laughs> in many ways, that even though I could have great wisdom to say to my children, true wisdom, that if it's not delivered in the proper tone, then not really any of it matters. Or I could have a, a, a discussion with my wife, okay, a discussion, and I could have the right of it, I mean the true godly right of it, but there's something in this general vicinity that seems to not communicate the right amount of tone. Does any of you have someone like that in your family? Uh, probably so. I know I'm not the only one, but uh, I'm working on it. Tone matters. David's song of celebra celebration suddenly turns to a contemplation, a tone shift in which he reflects the goodness and the greatness of God. But thankfully, his tone seems to soften or deepen. Looking back, let's look back at verse four. One thing have I asked. I mean, think about this, guys, as we get into this. He is being surrounded by people who mean to murder him, who mean to discredit his name, tear him down, and this is where he goes. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I would seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For... Note the tenses of what God not is doing, but will do. It's not even happening yet in David's present. He will hide me in the shelter of his day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. And the miles... Coverdale, which is an old English translation, Coverdale renders verse four like this, one thing have I desired of the Lord, one thing I will require, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the fair beauty of the Lord. The fair beauty of the Lord, I like that. But it begs the question, what is the fair beauty of the Lord? Well, we'll get into that pretty quickly in just a moment. David's conveying that the greatest joy in life is not found in the things of this world, but in knowing God and experiencing his presence. He's calling to mind heavenly realities, both past and present, and especially, as we just saw, those that are to come. Is that where you're finding your joy in life today? Are you finding your joy in your past, the good old days? Is it recalling to mind what God has done in your past? And that's good. What about today? Do you find a way to praise God today? How about in the future? How confident do we stand that knowing God is for us and already has visited that day and is fighting on our behalf? 
we come now to the heart of the message, the beauty of the Lord. So we're going to ask those three questions. Why do we need it? What is the beauty of the Lord? And how does it change our lives? Why do we need the beauty of the Lord? You see here a classic statement about prayer and contemplation. Gazing on the beauty of God in the temple. But look at David's life setting in which he can be summarized when we look at verse 5. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Gazing at the beauty of the Lord happens when? In the day of trouble. Should I be gazing at the beauty of God when I'm in my toughest circumstances? What is the day of trouble? Well, in verses 2 and 3, we see evil men attacking against him. That's trouble. Foes attacking him, discrediting his name, an army besieging him, and war breaking out against him. That's all bad. That's all trouble. That's all very tr big trouble. David was an ancient king and therefore suffered those kinds of things throughout his entire rule and even before his kingship. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't really relate to the troubles of a king. Can you? I mean, I don't have that kind of responsibility in my life. But, Maybe I can identify, and maybe you can identify with verse 10. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. What David is talking about here, from war to murder to abandonment, is the gambit of all human suffering. It's everything. So anything that you are facing this morning, any life circumstance that is pressing in on you, fits in David's emotion with you. Any problem, any position, any enemies in your life, they're addressed right here. What I like about this psalm is it seems to be in line with what Ernest Becker, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, wrote some years ago when he said, I think that taking life seriously means something such as this, that whatever man does on the, this planet has to be done in the lived truth of the terror of creation of the grotesque, of the rumble of panic underneath everything. Otherwise, it's false. That's a bit of an Oscar Grouch quote, I'm not gonna lie to you. I mean, it's a, little, it's a little bleak. But in other words, Ernest Becker is saying, if you're really going to take life seriously, it means you have to acknowledge that there is real evil and real terror in life. And there also exists a rumble of panic underneath everything. To close your eyes and only maintain being solely optimistic and ignoring evil of this life is to not really conducive to reality. He says you're not taking life seriously unless you admit that. Well, that's what the psalm does here today. Really, that's what the whole Bible does. David is conveying that gazing on the beauty of God is not just escapism or mysticism. Verse 5 says that in the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. Then in verse 6, and now my head shall be lifted up. My enemies all around me, I will offer in his tent sacrifices, shouts of joy, and I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Whatever threat David is experiencing, this gazing at the beauty of God enables him to have his head held high. Even though the enemies surround him, he's not escaping, he's not leaving to go off and pray, escaping his enemies, his enemies are all around him, closing in on him. But because his gaze is on the beauty of God, his head is up. Where are your eyes? Where is your chin, brother and sister? Are you fixed on the expectations of your boss at work or of what work of your job or your, your, uh, your company demands? Is your gaze on the security and safety of your children? I realize that's tough. Raising four children and making sure that they're safe and raised in, in the right way, that, that can really draw my attention. Is your gaze fixed on the desire to just reach that next level of income? That will certainly, that, that's gonna, what's going to make everything better when I get to that part, when that, when that increase comes. That's, that's what's going to fix everything. Or is your head lifted up to gaze on the fair beauty of the Lord? David is showing us how to cope with life's difficulties and triumph over them while bringing glory to God. That's why we need the beauty of the Lord, because of the rumble and terror of everything in life. So what is the beauty of the Lord? In verses 7 and 8, 
David says, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Okay, that seems like an easy concept to understand, but a difficult concept to put into practice. Don't you agree? I can say I'm looking for God, I'm looking for him, but really to calm myself from distractions and worries and to fix my eyes on the Lord, that's a difficult path for me sometimes. The language in the Bible of seeking God's face is not just to know God, but to have an experience of his presence. The word face is the same word as presence. So if you've ever read a text in the Old Testament where they say that they came into the presence of the king or what have you, there's no abstract Hebrew word like we have in the English for presence. It's face to face. Panim is the word in Hebrew. So for David, to use the word face here implies talking to God as though he knew him intimately, face to face. It's not just to believe in God in some general way, but rather to experience a real reality, a real presence of God in your soul and in your heart. Now David is saying, I want to actually experience your presence, Lord. Elsewhere in the Bible, people like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 experience the presence of God, and it is an experience of God's holiness or an experience of his glory. In Ezekiel chapter 1, there's a description of the overwhelming glory of God, but that's not exactly what David is describing here. David says, I want an experience of your presence so that I can just gaze upon your beauty. So what does that word mean? What does the word beauty of the Lord mean? This particular word means to have pleasure in the very perception. To have pleasure in the very perception. Regularly, perception brings you an awareness of something that you might find useful. For example, I'll be driving to work on a two-lane road, and a car in front of me is going a little slower, so I have the right the ability to pass. Well, I might put on my blinker, and I pull out into the oncoming traffic, I see a mile down the road that there's a car coming. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and slow down, yield, and I'm gonna get back in line because the awareness of me seeing down the road brings me some knowledge that my life intact is better than a head-on collision, correct? I mean, that's just a simple example that we would use there. Ordinarily, perception means I'm aware of the fact that there's something useful to me. I see that there's a car coming, it's useful for me to get that information, therefore, I get back in line. But when you perceive something beautiful, if it's a face or a landscape, listening to a piece of beautiful music, you experience pleasure in the perception. Me just noticing a car coming on isn't beautiful or or, or pleasurable to me. It's just informational, correct? But there's a difference in experiencing the perception of something beautiful. When I was in college, my last year of uh, senior year, I was finishing up. I'd, you know, I was just tasting the end of graduation was coming. I took a course called Literature and Film. And that course, you had to read pieces of literature, and then we would come back on a night class, and we would watch sections of a film that has been adapted from that passage. And we would talk about the finer points, and we'd need to write, letter, or write passages or, or, uh, or excerpts to our teacher explaining some differences that we saw about that. Uh, The professor would bring in a a DVD, uh, and and kids, a DVD is this little round thing with a hole in it that you uh, put in a machine. Your parents can tell you about that in a little bit. And we would watch these pieces. And so when I wrote the paper, my goal was not to be really excited about the literature of the film that I was watching. I was almost done with school. My goal was to write that paper so that I could get a good grade. So that I could get a good grade so that I could graduate, and I was ready to graduate so that I could move on and start a career. You could say that I was reading this literature in order to have a career or make money. Did I read Jane Austen or J.R.R. Tolkien? Sure, I did in that time. Was it useful to me? Yes. However, today, I would spend quite a bit of money and devote more of my time just to read those pieces of literature or watch those films. Why? Because the perception of Tolkien used to be useful to me but now the perception of Tolkien's writings to me are beautiful. And it is an end in itself. It is not just an instrument to something else. Does that make sense? 
And here's what David is saying. The beauty of God means to perceive him, to perceive who he is properly, to grasp who God is, what he has done, and to look at his attributes, his names, his actions, and to perceive God as he truly is and to find it pleasurable. If that is not true for you, if you say, well, I've never really experienced pleasure looking or thinking about God, contemplating his goodness, I'm aware of him, but I haven't really experienced him as beautiful, then you haven't really perceived him for who he truly is. Not fully, at least. If you really did, now hear me, guys, if you really did, you would find him beautiful. You would understand the implications of this claim by David then. Do you know how few people find God beautiful these days? The perception of him just bringing you pleasure, just saying, what are you doing, sitting out there on your porch? I'm just thinking about the Lord. I'm just full. My cup is full and overflowing thinking about how beautiful he is. By the way, the word beauty is used of God a number of times, but not always the same Hebrew word. There's several words to get across the idea of beauty. Isaiah 33 and 17 says, your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. They will see a land that stretches afar. But it's a different word than the word used here in Psalm 27, meaning pleasurable. When Isaiah uses the word beauty, he's talking about the king or God's excellence. Psalm 50 in verse two says, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. The beauty, God shines forth. What he's saying from, is from the temple, from the physical hill of Zion, the perfect beauty of God shines forth. The word beauty here means attractiveness or desirability. What does it mean to find anything beautiful? Well, it means, one, you, you see it always as excellent. You see it always as excellent. If you can find music, a beautiful person, or something uh, that you've created, a piece of art beautiful, you always say, oh, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That was the best movie. It was so awesome. You just got to go see it. But more than that, more than finding something excellent, you find that excellence attractive. You find that excellence attractive. Notice that David talks about gazing on the beauty. What is he gazing at? Have you ever looked at something and thought it was so amazing, so fascinating and beautiful that you just couldn't stop looking at it? You just stare. And then catch yourself staring and go, oh gosh, I've got I've to look away. <laughs> you just can't get enough of it. That's what we're talking about here. So you see it as excellent, you find that excellence attractive, and thirdly, it brings pleasure and satisfaction. That is what the beauty means in Psalm 27. If I'm restless or unhappy or tired, what do I do? And probably what do you do? You expose yourself to something beautiful, don't you? For example, you might be really restless one day, so you put on one of your favorite tracks of music and enjoy it and listen to it. What are you doing in that moment? Well, you're recharging your batteries. More than that, you're calming yourself down. You're from that rumble and panic. You're calming yourself down with the exposure to beauty. I work out in Umpqua at uh, Russell Prairie Rock Vineyards in the valley and the grounds there, they're just stunning, they're beautiful. In my day-to-day -day work, I can find myself rushing from place to place, from building to building, and the rumble of panic, it can catch up with me, I'll say that. There's this view that never fails to set me at ease there, though. When their uh, garage door is open to the winery and I'm walking kind of just in and out through the winery and that door is open, there is a, a view to the West Valley and it's just framed just perfectly. And it just always catches me, just the depth. It's so beautiful and it just stops and it really puts things in place for me when I see something so beautiful. There's just something about beauty. All human beings need it to calm themselves down in order to satisfy themselves. When we see something beautiful, it brings pleasure, it calms us, it gets rid of restlessness. And that, by the way, is what the Bible says is the mark of the beauty of God. Because Psalm 16 and verse 11, David actually says to God, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hebrew scholars say that the way David used the term fullness of joy in this verse actually is a double usage. Literally, it means in your presence there's joy, joy. Not that, you know, VBS song, the joy, 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 joy down in the depths. Not that one, but just fullness of joy. 
In the Semitic tradition, doubling a word intensifies its meaning. David's saying, in the face of God is the absolute satisfaction of joy. Your joy sensors are maxed out and can take no more. There's only one kind of beauty that will satisfy you fully and completely, that will actually give the soul what it's truly looking for. And if you have it, you know what it means. It means that when your enemies are surrounding you, you can lift up your head. When the worst things could possibly be happening to you, if you know what it's like to gaze on the beauty of God, you know it's not just another attribute of his. You can't really put it next to God's wisdom or his holiness or his love. It's not just one more attribute of God. The beauty of God is to find all of his attributes absolutely excellent, endlessly desirable, and more profoundly satisfying than any other kind of brilliance or excellence. In 1851, there was a man by the name of Alan Gardner, who was a a, a prominent uh, pastor and missionary, and he made the decision that he was going to sail from his home country of England to South America to open up uh, a mission outpost. He left everything behind, a prominent career, uh, you know, everything that could have been continued to go for him if he stayed abroad, or uh, home side, and uh, he uh, sailed, set sail. Well, he unfortunately never made it to South America. His ship foundered, sank, and as he was washed ashore with some provisions at Tierra del Fuego, which is the very tip of South America, where he eventually died of starvation and thirst. Later, when his body was found, they discovered that he had been keeping a journal. What was so interesting about the journal was, as he was dying of hunger and thirst, the last thing he wrote in his journal was a contemplation on Psalm 34, verse 10, which says, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And right below that verse, he wrote the last thing that he ever wrote. He said, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. What? (laughs) I mean, really? I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God? Why wasn't he mad? He'd given up everything important in his home. He'd given up his family, his career, his comfort. He'd given up everything. Why was he not mad, angry, or afraid? Well, it was because he had the main thing that he wanted in the first place before he had set sail. There's a kind of beauty and brilliance and excellence in career. But God wasn't merely useful to Alan. He wasn't using God in order to have a brilliant missionary portfolio or to make God as a stepping stone to a better platform for his life. God wasn't useful to him. God was beautiful. And he had the main thing he wanted. Consider your life right now. Can you say that if you were in your last days through starvation and thirst, that you would be overwhelmed with the sense of the goodness of God. Brother and sister, I have confidence that you can say that. How many of us could stand up here today and testify to the goodness of God in our lives today? To proclaim his goodness, his faithfulness throughout all generations in our life. You see, there are a lot of people, I call them religious people, who will use God. That's, that's their goal. They think they receive things from God because they obey God. So when they get things, they serve God more and more just so they can get more things from God and the cycle continues. But Christians, true Christians, we serve God to get God. He is the one and only object of our affection just to please him, just to delight in him, just to get close to him because God is the one thing, that one thing I have asked of the Lord. Alan Gardner learned to die with his face up because nothing else could face him after seeing the beauty of the Lord. So we've covered why we need the beauty of the Lord, what is the beauty of the Lord, and now it brings us to the final question, how does the beauty of the Lord change our lives? I'm going to give you the answer right out the gate. The answer is, you've got to go to the temple. You've got to go to the temple. Notice how often David says in this very psalm, verse 27, look back at verse 4 in Psalm 27. He says in the first part of verse 4, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. 
And then in the last half of the verse, to inquire in his temple. Verse 5 at the end, conceal me under the cover of his tent or his tabernacle. And then later, next verse over, I will offer in his tent. Now, there are a number of people that I've encountered over the years who push back against the idea David puts forth here. They say, you know, in ancient times, in ancient Israel, there were people, they were superstitious, and you know, they had to make sacrifices in the temple, so that's obviously why they would go and they would inquire in God's temple. Living in the Pacific Northwest for many years, I've heard, you know, I don't need to go to church on Sundays. The mountains and the trees, those are, that's my cathedral. That's where I meet God and see his beauty. Well, you know what I think about that? I think it's misguided. Sure, the heavens declare the beauty of the Lord. There is no doubt about that. Even scripture testifies to it. I have no argument with them there. But where I am confronted with others who write in scripture, other biblical writers like in Psalm 84 and verse three, where it says, even a sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord hosts, my King of my God. God created animals even to be drawn to his presence, guys. Psalm 65 in verse four, blessed is the one who chooses to bring near, to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. See, the Bible over and over again in the Old Testament says, the place you're going to see beauty of God is in the temple. Of course, you can see the beauty of God outside, absolutely, but mainly you're going to see the beauty of God at its most intense, at its ultimate, at its most magnificent expression in the temple. So it begs the question then, for us today, what's the temple? The Old Testament, the Israelites were given instructions to build the tabernacle, a sort of mobile temple, which was used for sacrifices to please the Lord. And later on, God gave them instructions to build the temple in Jerusalem. In the temple, uh, shown behind me, a cross section, there uh, was uh, a section for priests to make sacrifices, especially in the Holy of Holies. There was an, the Ark of the Covenant placed there, and over the Ark of the Covenant was a gold slab and an area called the mercy seat. One day a year, the high priest brought the blood sacrifice atoning for the sins of the people to the Holy of Holies and spread the blood over the mercy seat. What do we know about that? Well, we know this. God says that That is where my presence will appear. What is the glory? The glory cloud of God, which is called the the Shekinah, which was the, the, the same pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day that led the Israelites out of Egypt. The Shekinah glory, it was the very presence of God when it was, he was in the tabernacle. And so when the tabernacle was established, uh, and then later the temple was established, there was a Shekinah. Kids, do you remember what happened whenever the temple was established? You remember what happened when they finally made all the sacrifices? What was the next thing God did? He filled the presence of the temple so much so that they could not even like, stay in the presence of the Lord. It was so full. I had appeared over the Holy Holies, and over the, the Holy Holies in particular, God said to them, I will speak to you over my mercy seat. I will appear to you over the mercy seat when the blood is sprinkled for the atoning sacrifice. That's what my beauty is going to be shown. Yes, you can see my beauty in the ocean. Yes, you can see beauty in forests and mountains. But my beauty, God says, is not as evident in creation as it is in redemption. Therefore, in the Old Testament, the beauty of God appears over the place of sacrifice. That's weird. I'm going here, I'm going to a place with this. Why would we be talking about the beauty of the Lord and tabernacles and temples and places of sacrifice? Well, centuries later, Jesus is having a conversation and a discussion with a Samaritan woman at a well. In John chapter 4, she says this to him, starting in verse 20. She says, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Did Jesus say, oh, don't be superstitious? You can worship God anywhere. No. 
He also did not say to the Samaritan woman, you have to go to Jerusalem. What did he say? He said, the hour is coming, but it is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. What is Jesus saying? Well, what he was saying was, a time is coming and is now here that something new is happening. It's it's changed so that anyone can see his beauty in other geographical locations than just the temple. What Jesus was saying was about to happen, well, it was Christ. It was Jesus' mission that was about to happen. This is where we come to our last point, God's beautiful answer to our most threatening need, our most ultimate need. What was Jesus going to do? Well, Paul wrote in Philippians to tell us that even though Jesus was the Son of God, he was equal with God, which means he was a glory, as glorious as the Father, as beautiful as the Father, yet he emptied himself of that glory. And in Isaiah 53, the great prophecy about the coming Messiah, talking about Jesus as the coming and suffering servant, Isaiah puts it very starkly in verse two where he says, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men and he was esteemed not. So Jesus came very unbeautifully and unbrilliantly. He wasn't marked by excellence. He wasn't a great philosopher. He wasn't a general as many expected him to be. He wasn't a beautiful looking person. It says he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. And even it gets worse than that because something else must have happened in Isaiah 53 when it also talks about the suffering servant like this. There were many who were appalled at him for his appearance was so disfigured that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Well, if you've been with us for any amount of time, you know what we're talking about here. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is beautiful beyond bearing, who is fairest among 10,000, says the old hymn, lost his beauty, emptied himself of his beauty, and went to the cross where he has beaten and crucified. Jesus Christ, who was absolutely beautiful, became radically disfigured and distorted. Why? He was dying on the cross for our sins. He was paying the penalty for our sins, just like that atonement blood being sprinkled over the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Jesus Christ, on the cross, got the curse that we deserve. He became disfigured. He became marred. He became subject to decay. Jesus Christ did all of that because when he died on the cross to pay for our sins, the Bible says that when you believe in him, everything that Jesus Christ has done is now transferred to us as merit. We get the credit for what he did. He gets the punishment we deserve. We get the credit for what he did, which means that in the eyes of God right now, those who put their faith in the Lord, you are beautiful in his sight. You are perfect. Legally, you are beautiful. Your sins are taken away. And someday, as we're told in Ephesians chapter 5, that Christ, our true husband, who is washing us and cleansing us, not only will make us beautiful in the eyes of God, but also will be made beautiful in each other's eyes as well. We will be spotless, perfect, gorgeous. Jesus Christ lost his beauty and became disfigured so that we, who are spiritually ugly and disfigured, could become absolutely beautiful. So I ask each of you this question today. How does that hit you? How does seeing what the real beauty of the Lord did for you to be made truly beautiful in God's eyes sit in your soul? Do you find that truth to be useful? Like a car in oncoming traffic? Or do you find it to be altogether excellent, endlessly desirable, and more profoundly satisfying than any other kind of brilliance or excellence? It's more beautiful than a mountain. It's more beautiful than the ocean. It's more beautiful or stunning and worthy of your gaze than any other earth-shaking crisis in your life. For David in Psalm 27, the beauty of God happens over sacrifice. To come to God at our great and matchless king and let go of the tension we hold between trusting him and the cares of this world which so easily entangle us. We're here to declare today that the beauty of God still happens over the place of sacrifice, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. There is more beautiful, there's nothing more beautiful than that sacrifice. 
not a mountain, not an ocean, nothing. His love is excellent. His beautiful and worthy of praise. His love is attractive. There's nothing more attractive than that love. And finally, his love is satisfying. And it will put you at rest, even in the middle of the most threatening situation you could be in. As you get older and lose the beauty that you once had, maybe we've put on a little extra pounds or we've lost some of those rugged, handsome features of our teenage years. You had it and you strive for excellence and you're not as good as you wanted to be. You know you're trying to prove yourself. I'm reminded of what Psalm 90 and verse 17 says. Let the favor and beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The more you see the beauty of what Jesus Christ did for you, the more that you relax and you are calmed by it. And the more peace you get, the more we can say, it is your face, Lord, I will seek. And then we can harmonize in verse 13 of this psalm, as David said, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let us pray. Lord, it is so humbling to be in your presence. You are altogether worthy and beautiful and and worthy of praise. God, it's also a hard tension to hold because we want to look at your beauty. We're drawn to beauty and what could be more beautiful than you? Yet you know our hearts, O oh Lord. We are prone to wander. We are prone to worry. So Lord, I pray that you would meet us in our need, in our deep desire. May we call to mind the confidence of those who have gone before us like David. The confidence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the garden when death was before him. The confidence of our own lives that we have seen you come to our aid in times of trouble. May we say we will worship in your house. We will worship in the temple. And yet, God, you have provided even the best way for the temple to be made accessible through the gift of your Holy Spirit so that we would be the living temple that worships and builds up a house of praise to you, Father. I pray that as we close this time of worship together today, that you would be honored and seen as so beautiful and worthy of every single ounce of praise because you are good and excellent and you are pleasurable. Amen.